Ten years ago, Britain was in flames. Some of the scenes looked like the Blitz. Flames licking through iconic buildings, some of which had been standing for a century. Shops were being looted. Police were being assaulted. Police were assaulting others. Communities began to break apart in some areas. One of those was Birmingham, where conflict in Asian areas with other ethnicities became a very, very dangerous specter haunting a great city, the second city in the country. Asian people formed up outside their mosques, outside their businesses, to protect them from marauding rioters. One of them was Harun Tariq Jahan, who at the age of 21 had his life taken from him by rioters who deliberately mounted the pavement and mowed him and his friends down. Since when, his father has become a national treasure. Tariq Jahan was one of the men who calmed the situation in Birmingham and stopped it from falling completely out of control. If you want your sons to die, keep on rioting, he said. If you don't want your sons to die, calm down and go back home. In the decades since, Harun Tariq Jahan Foundation has been born and does some very good work in the West Midlands on reconciliation between different communities and helping those who've fallen on hard times. Tariq Jahan, looking fantastic, looking younger than he did back then, has joined me now on board the Sputnik. I, it must be uh, terrific for you to have at least rescued something from the ashes of your son's tragic, I would call it murder, manslaughter at least. You've seized on these terrible times and done something great with it, Tarek. You have my uh, full admiration. But take yourself back, if it's not too painful, to that terrible night. Tell the viewers what happened. Thank you, George. Um, 10 years on for a lot of people, for me, it seems like it was yesterday. Um, time doesn't uh, move on for a family once you've lost a loved member. But um, the riots had uh, started because of the shooting of Mark Duggan in Tottenham. They escalated, come to Birmingham. And um, I came back from work with my son at the time. We just parked up the, the lorry and um, stepped in the house and the, the community were already outside. They'd approached us and um, asked whether we joined them in uh, protecting the businesses and homes in the local community because the day before they'd been attacked and um, some were looted, some were set on fire. And I said, yes, you know, um, not knowing what was to come, um, I put my sons forward and told them both to go and stand with the community um, while I went inside, uh, discussed with the family. I came back out, joined the lads, and we stood for most of the night protecting um, the shops and businesses. The looters had come down, and when they'd seen the large um, group of people, they didn't do anything and walked on. But as the light drew later and later, at one o'clock in the early hours of the morning, um, a group came down, and when they realized they couldn't rob the shops because of this crowd, they went away, made plans, came back with vehicles, and um, I remember standing around the corner just outside my front door. I heard the car, and um, then I heard the bang, and I looked at my son's face, who was standing opposite me, my oldest, and we knew that someone was hurt. We ran instinctively. We ran round. I got round the corner, and the first man I found on the ground, um, the instinct was just a first aid. Uh, I'm first aid trained, and um, I had no idea who the gentleman was at the time. Even though he was a friend, I didn't recognize him because of the condition he was in. Um, I gave first aid. I started his heartbeat. I gave him oxygen. I heard the heartbeat. I felt the heartbeat. And within a few moments, someone else approached me, another um, 
first aider who I knew, he was from the gym, and he said to me, "There's a, I'll take over, there's two more over behind you, go and check on them. Uh, when I move over and ran, the second man who was faced up, his eyes were glazed, and when I moved his body from the curb to the, to the street, um, I realized there was nothing I could do, George. He was, he was gone. There was nothing in the world I could do to save him. The, second, the third man, who was face down lying on top of the second man, I rolled his body over, and then I found my son. You know, um, the shock that goes through your system, your mind s shuts down for a split second. And my instinctive thought was, you know, God, don't let him go right now. You know, um, let me help. My eldest who started crying straight away, um, I said to him, get on your knees. We got to help him, otherwise we'll lose him. I don't know how badly he's damaged, but let's, let's give him first aid. I checked his heartbeat, no heartbeat, no breathing. I started his heart. I could hear the heart thumping away very fast once it started. And um, what can I say, George? I um, leaned forward and gave my son oxygen to try and breathe for him. But um, every time I blew in his mouth, um, warm blood would gush out of his nose and you know, um, spill all over my face. I did this three times and realized that my son had too many internal injuries and there was not much more I could do for him. Um, I left him on the ground, I let him go. Um, we tried, everyone tried whatever they could do to help him. There was not much we could do. The ambulance arrived 25 minutes later. They took over and um, they put him in the ambulance and took him to the hospital. The uh, situation is that nobody has faced justice uh, for the killing of your son, neither for murder or even manslaughter or anything uh, at all. Eight people were acquitted uh, in court. That must continue to gnaw away at you and the families of the others. It does, George. Um, you know, I, I, for 10 years, I've been asking the same question. Why is there no justice for, for three men that were killed, you know, defending their communities, doing the job of the police? But unfortunately, um, I was told to, to wait for, for answers. I've waited 10 years. I've spoken to every prime minister since David Cameron. And um, they all have the same answer. We're looking into it. We'll let you know. Um, they invite me down to the Houses of Parliament. They serve tea and biscuits. And then they say, we'll get back to you when we know something. And um, I've lost faith. To be quite honest, I've lost faith. The smouldering problems in Britain, uh, which led to the riots 10 years ago, haven't really gone away either, have they? As you pointed out, the proximate cause was the shooting in London, in North London, in Tottenham, of Mark Duggan uh, by police officers. Uh, the flames then died down. The window panes were replaced. The dead were buried. But it could all happen again, couldn't it? Absolutely, George. You know, um, the people are frustrated. We've just had this uh, pandemic um, with uh, COVID as the excuse for, for holding us all back. Um, when you speak to the general public, the, the average person on the street, they're frustrated. Lack of work, no money, hard to do anything. Um, you're not allowed to move around and so on and so on. Okay, the, the, it's been lifted now, but the frustrations are there. People don't have the money. They're, they're not able to spend. Um, they're not able to travel. Uh, you, you hear the frustration uh, and the anger. On top of that, you know, there are many issues in this country that need resolving. Now, as I said, you, you founded the, uh, the Harun Tariq Jahan Foundation in the name of your late son. What kind of things does it do? We're a very small charity, George. Um, there are only five of us in the charity, um, three are family members, my daughter, my son, and I have um, Caroline Bradley and Habib Rahman. They are business people. They help out in the charity. I've worked in Syria. Uh, I've worked in Turkey. Um, in this country, we've done, uh, we feed the homeless, um, children's hospital. We raise funds for the children's hospital on a regular basis. Um, mental health issues. Uh, there's, there's, there's so many different things. 
Um, you'd have to actually go on the website to check out as how many there are in total. Finally, what's the what's the your demand, your family's demand? Uh, do you want people charged? Do you want a, a proper inquiry? Because there never really was a public inquiry into the events a decade ago. Uh, w what route do you want to go down? George, I would have, I would have uh, been quite happy with a public inquiry. Um, from the IPCC report, the police were the ones that were condemned for making mistakes. Um, I can't hold anyone accountable. I can't do anything on my own. When I've tried to pursue civil litigation, I've been told it's so expensive, I cannot afford it. I don't want to raise funds by the public. Um, I, I, I don't expect the public to pay for anything. Um, but the government, who the police work for, the government are in charge. They're responsible for their officers. If they've made the mistake, then I expect the government to step up and say, we're the ones uh, at fault here and we need to correct this. There needs to be a public inquiry into why three men were killed and there are no answers for the family. There is no justice for both families. So I, I would prefer a public inquiry. But if I'm being frank and honest with you, I have no faith in any of the leaders that I have dealt with so far. I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, may God have mercy on Harun and God bless you for all of your efforts, rescuing good works out of the ashes of that terrible night. Tarek Jahan, thanks for joining us on the Sputnik. Thank you, George. It's been a pleasure.